Okay. It's on. On? Yeah, okay. <laughs> Today's scripture reading is Matthew 5, 17 through 20. Don't misunderstand why I have come. I did not come to abolish the law of Moses or the writings of the prophets. No, I came to accomplish their purchase, their purpose. I tell you the truth, until heaven and earth disappear, not even the smallest detail of God's love will disappear until its purpose is achieved. So if you ignore the least commandment and teach others to do the same, you will be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But anyone who obeys God's law and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. But I warn you, unless your righteousness is better than the righteousness of the teachers of religious law and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Thank you, Marianne. Let's start with prayer. <clears throat> Father in heaven, we do thank you that you love us. We thank you that your spirit empowers us to live a holy, set-apart life. We thank you and praise you that we know that we have a hope beyond anything that people that don't understand can comprehend, that it's not just something we look forward to. It's a certainty that we have that Jesus Christ will return and that he will claim those that belong to him. So, Lord, help us to live this life one day at a time where we are lights and examples to the world, where we deny ourselves, take up whatever our cross is, and follow after you, that we consider our lives not our own, but bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. We thank you and praise you. Thy will be done and thy kingdom come. And, Lord, help us to forgive our enemies as Christ forgave us. We just thank you and praise you. We thank you for this day that we can come and worship you in this country. We thank you for our religious freedoms. Help us to not take lightly such a great salvation, but help us to live like Jesus in this world. We pray this in his precious name. Amen. <clears throat> so if you don't know, we've been reading along as a church, at least I hope we have as a church, um, a five-by-five five reading plan where we read five days through the week, a different chapter in the New Testament, and we'll completely read the New Testament in one year. And then we reflect on Saturday and Sunday, and my Sunday teachings are generally on what we read this past week. So we read 1 Corinthians chapter 3 through 1 Corinthians chapter 7. So I jumped into chapter 7 Friday night, so we can avoid that right now. If you read along, you know what I'm talking about, because Paul says, now regarding the questions you asked me about sexual relations. So we've already covered that. We don't have to cover that today. <laughs> There's some smiles on faces. And we really didn't cover last week 1 Corinthians at all. I kind of set up 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians was a letter that Paul wrote after spending a year and a half starting and developing this church. It was a result of him stopping in Corinth, which is in Greece. It's a, a seaport city of the world where they worshipped gods and goddesses and they lived, they ate and drank uh, to be married today because tomorrow they might die. And they had all kind of pagan gods and goddesses. So it was a place that people definitely, if they believed in Jesus, needed to be set apart and holy, sanctified, looking different than the world, foreigners. A lot like today. If you don't look like Jesus in this world, then you look like everybody else. If you look like everybody else, how are you doing God's will? How are you drawing people home? Where is your home? Is it Bonners Ferry, Idaho? Or is it in heaven? Are you foreigners and aliens in this world? Because scripture tells you to live this way. And if this church realized this, if they let go of the world, then we probably wouldn't have this letter. But we have this letter, so let's learn from this letter. And there's all kind of sins that are going on in the church and you think, oh, wow, how could they ever do this? But as you're reading this letter, and I'll challenge you again at the end, let God examine your heart, your church. 
to see how much it is set apart and holy, bringing glory and honor to God. Because it's so easy for the yeast of the Pharisees, hypocrisy, to come in and water down the church to where it doesn't look that much like Jesus anymore. What did Jesus do? I always say that instead of what would Jesus do. What did Jesus do? He did exactly like he taught. When he did the Sermon on the Mount, he expounded, and that's where uh, Marianne read from this morning. He's not talking anything different than what the law already said. But he's raising the bar and, your, and raising your understanding of what scriptures really mean. And how blessed you are because God loved you so much that he gave his one and only son to die for you. And how much more that you should be a holy, set-apart people. The prophets and the saints in the Old Testament could only long for God living inside of you. And today, instead of going much over Corinthians, we're going to go back into the Old Testament a good bit. But let me remind you of Jesus' words prior to the ones that Mary Ann wrote. Just prior to Jesus saying, don't misunderstand why I have come, he, wrote, he said this, You, put your name in there, Alan, is the salt of the earth. But what good is salt if it has lost its flavor? I'm salt, but if I don't watch it, the hypocrisy can slip in. It can, I can become watered down, and instead of being like Christ in this world, I can lose my flavor. And if that's the case, can you make it salty again? No. It will be thrown out and trampled underfoot as worthless. You are also the light of the world. Alan is the light of the world. Like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden, no one lights a lamp and puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all of those to see so that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. Then comes the words, Do not misunderstand why I have come. This church in Corinth was not a light to the world. They weren't salt. They were like the world rather than being like Christ. What a shame. And Paul had spent a year and a half there. He had stopped in Corinth to preach in the synagogues to the Jews, and you can find this in Acts chapter 18. And the Jews were so much against him that God had to tell him not to fear for his life. So he said, I'm not going to preach to the Jews anymore. Isn't that a shame? But... God is so good. On the other hand, he brought preaching to the Gentiles. Wow. If you are like Christ in this world, he's going to work through you. If you're like Judas in this world or Pharaoh in this world or whoever else in this world that doesn't live like Christ, he's still going to work his will his way. And Paul writes in 1 Corinthians that each man's work is is going to be shown for what it is on the day that Jesus returns. That means Alan's work again. That means your work. Each man's work is going to be shown for what it is. If you have the foundation of Jesus Christ, if you truly believe, then guess what? You'll be saved. That's what the Scripture says. But still your work will be examined to see if it was worthwhile, to see if it lasts. And though you may escape as through the flames and be saved, what about the life that you lived, that Jesus died to give you new life? What will your life have to show for it? So Paul moved on to a house, if you read Acts chapter 18, and started a house church. <laughs> That's how this church in Corinthians started. He spent a year and a half there. This is on his second missionary journey, and then he moves on. And if you were reading along, you know that someone else came in, another pastor came in, but there was division in the church, and one of the first things they, that's addressed in the letter is they argued over who was the better pastor, pretty much. And some even said, well, we just follow Jesus because we don't follow any of these guys. There was division in the church. And that's why Chloe's household wrote a letter we don't have. So 1 Corinthians isn't really 1 Corinthians, but don't get lost on that. 
And then in chapter 7, Paul says, as those things that you wrote me for about sexual relations, let me address those now. So more than likely, that wasn't Chloe's letter because she wrote about the division. So there, 1 Corinthians is actually 2nd, 3rd, who knows? <laughs> and if these kind of divisions were going on in the church, Paul probably wrote several correspondence back and forth to where he writes this one and he addresses all kind of sin that has come up in the church. That slow fade that's really faster than you think it is where you're one day walking down the path of righteousness and the next day you're off a little bit, the next day you're off a little more till all of a sudden you can't realize, you cannot understand how and why you ever got in the pig pen in a foreign country. But see, even with that, all you've got to do is come to the realization, come to your senses, that there's a God in heaven that loves you so much that He sent His Son to die for you. That not only that you could have eternal life, that is the end result of our salvation, but that so you could live like Jesus today, tomorrow, each day at a time. What a blessed people we are. And today we're going to go back 1,500 years prior to 1 Corinthians. And we're going to see what God talks about, about His people, His children, what we would relate to the church now. <clears throat> so I want to ask you a question. How serious are you about your salvation? How serious are you about your faith? It's the most serious thing that you can ha have in your life. If you were bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ and you've entered into a new covenant, and the reason I use covenant, which is the same thing as the New Testament, is because God has made several covenants with man. One is when he destroyed the world by the flood. He made a covenant that he wouldn't do that anymore. And we have the sign of the rainbow. That's what the rainbow's for, guys. Not anything else. That God would not destroy this earth again by flood. We have several of other covenants. A covenant means that two people enter into a contract together. God says, I will love you. You will be my people. The agreement to that is you will be faithful, holy, set apart. You will be obedient. You will hear and obey. But we don't hold up to our end of the covenant. So God makes a new covenant. And he makes a new covenant. And he has a promise that he's going to make a new covenant still to where he writes these laws in our heart. And that covenant is written with the blood of Jesus Christ. It says that you and I belong to God. Not only do we belong to God now, but we are a brother or sister with Jesus Christ. That we are God's child. How should you live as foreigners and aliens in this world, as holy and set apart? Not my will, but your will, Father. <clears throat> so let's go back. I told you about 1,500 years prior to that, to Egypt. Why did God do all the mighty miracles that he did? So that... Pharaoh would set his people free so that they could worship him. Go back and read it. It says it over and over and over again because we need to get it through our heads. We need to read it ten times. Oh, the reason that God did these mighty works was to show who he was so that his people could worship him. And by worshiping him, those people are set apart and holy. They are lights that cannot be hidden to the world. They are salt that gives flavor to the world. But what did they do? They grumbled in the wilderness and many of them were destroyed. It didn't take long, did it? Because we want our way, not God's way. That's the whole problem with sin. And that's the reason that Jesus came to save us. And we can't live any other way. So God is so wonderful, so kind that He gives us His Spirit to live in and through us, 
to renew our mind, to change our way of thinking so that it can transform us, so that as we deny ourselves and take up our cross and follow after Him, we can be like Christ in this world. Until we are sanctified totally through and through and through. And the more that you read and hunger for God's Word, the more that you allow the Holy Spirit to transform your thinking, the more that you follow in the footsteps of Jesus, the more this world will become foreign to you. Those things that you used to do, you'll find no desire for anymore. They will be foreign. You'll think, why would I ever do that? Exodus chapter 19, if you want to turn there, because I'm going to go through several scriptures. I'm going to read a lot of scripture today. Exodus chapter 19, starting in verse 3. Then Moses went up to God, and the Lord called to him from the mountain. This is what you are to tell the house of Jacob and explain to the sons of Israel. You have seen for yourself what I did to Egypt and how I carried you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now I'm going to relate that, and I'm going to do that as we're going through Scripture, but that's probably about all I'm going to put into it. Think about what God has done for you and how He's going to carry you, not to just the promised land, but to an eternity with Him where there is no sin, no death, nothing else, through Jesus Christ. You are blessed so much more than the people of Israel were when they saw the mighty power of God. Verse 5, Now if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, that's why I went into the covenant, you shall be my treasured possession out of all the nations, for the whole earth is mine. And unto me you shall be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Sounds a lot like what we see it, read in the New Testament about the church except what brings us into that covenant is so much more precious. It's God's Son laying down His life for us. <clears throat> Verse 10, Then the Lord said to Moses, Go to the people and consecrate them. Make them holy. Today and tomorrow they must wash their clothes and be prepared by the third day. For on the third day the Lord will come down on Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. They must be washed clean. This is a serious matter. Verse 16, on the third day when morning came, there was thunder and lightning. A thick cloud was upon the mountain, and a very loud blast of the ram's horn went out, so that all the people in the camp trembled in holy fear. We sometimes forget that God is still the same. He is the commander of angel armies. But yet He does love you. And out of reverent holy fear, you should live a life that brings glory and honor to Him and be obedient to what He tells you to do. Then Moses brought the people, verse 17, out of the camp to meet with God. And they stood at the foot of the mountain. Mount Sinai was completely enveloped in smoke because the Lord had descended on it in fire. <laughs> he descended upon you and I in holy fire by the baptism of the Holy Spirit. No coincidence, the same thing. But instead of trembling in fear, you got to cry out, Father, Abba, Daddy, thank you. There's no fear because perfect love casts out fear of condemnation, of judgment. Because you have been made right in God's eyes. You have been sanctified. You've been set apart and made holy. And it is His will that you be sanctified through and through by the reading of God's Word and by the Spirit. <clears throat> and the smoke rose like the smoke of a furnace, and the whole mountain quaked violently, not just the people, but the earth itself. And the sound of the ram's horn grew louder and louder. Moses spoke, and God answered him in the thunder. The Lord descended to the top of Mount Sinai and called Moses to the summit. So Moses went up. And the Lord said to him, Go down and warn the people not to break through to see the Lord, lest many of them perish. Even the priests who approach the Lord must consecrate themselves, or, they, or the Lord will break out against them. But Moses said to the Lord, The people cannot come up to Mount Sinai, for you solemnly warned us, Put a boundary around the mount and mountain and set it apart as holy. Do you realize now that each and every second of every day, not only can you go up the mountain, but you can go all the way to heaven 
because your prayers reach all the way there. Because God has come to you through Jesus Christ. Think of the picture that day and the trembling of God's people. They were God's people. If they saw you today, they'd be like, we cannot believe this. You guys get to come in God's presence every single second of every day. Do you realize that? We're going to read on. Exodus chapter 20. You know what's there, the Ten Commandments, so I'm not going to go through them. But I'm going to remind you about this verse in verse 5. I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquities of the fathers on their children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing loving devotion to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. Love me and keep my commandments. And there's the promise with it. Thousand generations. I don't know exactly what it means, but that sounds a lot better than the sin cast on for a few generations. I'll, t I'll take B. For those who love me and keep my commandments. Verse 18, when all the people witnessed the thunder and the lightning, the sounding of the ram's horn and the mountain enveloped in smoke, they trembled and stood at a distance. Speak to us yourself and we will listen, they said to Moses. But do not let God speak to us or we will die. Do not be afraid, Moses replied, for God has come to test you so that the fear of him may be before you to keep you from sinning. You know the reason so many people speed? Because the punishment's not that bad, is it? If the punishment was to cut off your leg so you couldn't hit the gas pedal anymore, that'd solve the problem of speeding, wouldn't it? I know that's a silly analogy, but hey, because you would fear your leg being cut off. Fear the one who has authority to cast your soul into hell for all eternity. But you don't have to fear that if you belong to God through Jesus Christ. So are you living like it? Verse 24, you are to make me an altar of earth. We see that sacrifices are a part of worship. And sacrifice it on it, your burnt offerings and peace offerings, your sheep and goats and cattle, in every place where I cause my name to be remembered. And then we get another promise. God is so good in all this. I will come to you and bless you. Then you're going to read in Exodus all of these different commandments to establish court. And here we are back into Corinthians where the church has to go outside of the church to secular court. Because they're having lawsuits among believers. How far have we fallen? I'm going to skip to Exodus chapter 23, verse 20. Behold, I am sending an angel before you to protect you along the way and to bring you to the place I have prepared. An angel to protect them that you had to listen to because he's going to take you to a place that's been prepared. We got Jesus, the Son of God to protect us, to be our advocate in heaven while the Holy Spirit is our advocate here on earth saying, they belong to you. Jesus even said on the cross, forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. He's interceding for you and I because He loves us so much as long as you're covered by His blood. And we'll get to that here in a minute. Verse 21, pay attention to him and listen to his voice. Do not defy him, for he will not forgive rebellion, since my name is in him. Oh, what a greater name is the name of Jesus. But if you will listen carefully to his voice and do everything I say, I will be an enemy to your enemies and a foe to your foes. For my angel will go before you and bring you into the land of the Amorites, Hittites, Perizzites, Canaanites, Hivites, and Jebusites, and I will annihilate them. You must not bow down to their gods or serve them or follow their practices. I don't think the Corinthian church ever left that part of the world. It doesn't seem like it. Instead, you are to demolish them and smash their sacred stones to pieces. So you shall serve the Lord your God. Serve with your life. And he will bless, you, bless, your, excuse me, bless your bread and your water. And I will take away sickness from among you. No woman in your land will miscarry or be barren. I will fulfill the number of your days. 
Now, I don't know if you know about it, but there are writings, and we'll, we'll get to them, in the New Testament that talk about sickness among you because of the things you're doing, the sins that you're doing. They're still in your life. Even the unholy way in which you're remembering Jesus and taking communion. God doesn't want you to be sick. That's why He's going to take all that away. And the more you live now, you've got promises here of blessings in your life if you take seriously obeying God's commandments. I will send, verse 27, my terror ahead of you and throw into confusion every nation you encounter. I will make all your enemies turn and run. I will send the hornet before you to drive the Hivites and Canaanites and Hittites out of your way. I will not drive them out before you in a single year. Otherwise, the land would become desolate and wild animals would multiply against it, against you. Little by little, I will drive them out ahead of you until you become fruitful and possess the land. They still had to live in a foreign land until it became theirs. We still are foreigners living in this land. But we have to, just like the Israelites, live as though we belong to another kingdom. That we are God's, that we are His children, that we are set apart and holy. And we have to live in such a way that the world sees that. <clears throat> Verse 31, And I will establish your borders from the Red Sea to the Sea of the Philistines and from the desert to the Euphrates. For I will deliver the inhabitants into your hand and you, will drive, and you will drive them out before you. You shall make no covenant with them or with their gods. They must not remain in your land lest they cause you to sin against me. And here we are right back at Corinthians. For if you serve their gods, it will surely be a snare to you. Chapter 24, and yours may say some type of title. I'm reading from the Berrien Study Bible. It says, The Covenant Sealed. Because the covenant has to be sealed by something. The rainbow was the promise in Noah's day. It's sealed by blood here of rams and goats. Your covenant with your relationship with God that nothing can separate you from Him is sealed by the blood of Jesus. First, chapter 24, verse 1. Then the Lord said to Moses, Come up to the Lord, you and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, and seventy of Israel's elders, and you are to worship at a distance. Moses alone shall approach the Lord, but the others must not come near, and the people not, may not go up with him. When Moses came and told the people all the words and ordinances of the Lord, they all responded with one voice, All the words that the Lord has spoken we will do. And Moses wrote down all the words of the Lord. Early the next morning he got up and built an altar at the base of the mountain along with the twelve, twelve pillars for the twelve tribes of Israel. Then he set out some young men of Israel and they offered burnt offerings and sacrificed young bulls as peace offerings to the Lord. Moses took half of the blood and put it into bowls and the other half he sprinkled on the altar. Then he took the book of the covenant and read it to the people who replied, all the Lord has spoken, we will do, and we will be obedient. Here's your covenant established. I will give you the promised land. You give me your obedience. We will. And it's sealed with blood on the altar. And then the next part, so Moses took the other half of the blood, and I added in the other half of the blood, which was in the bowl, and he sprinkled it on the people and said, This is the blood of the covenant that the Lord has made with you in accordance with with all these words. Now do you remember what Jesus said on the night before His betrayal? This is the blood of the new covenant. And if you agree, if you say you believe that Jesus is the Messiah, which implies that you will be obedient to Him. Remember Jesus calls you a disciple first, then a brother. He never used the term Christian, but the term Christian came when we were acting like Christ in the world. If you agree that Jesus is the Messiah, you agree to follow Him, if you cry out to Him as Lord, He will save you. His blood covers you. And your sins are white instead of scarlet. Your filthiness is gone. Your sins are cast as far as the east is from the west. 
was talking to somebody yesterday and they said they always struggled with thinking they were good enough in God's eyes. And I said, you need to give that struggle right now to God because He sees you through Jesus. If you're struggling anymore, that's just a lie from Satan. You are blessed. You are holy. You are justified. Live like it. And I went on to say that if you're trying by your own power, you're going to continue to fall. But if instead you treat it as I am already in this covenant agreement because of what Jesus did for me, wow, I love you, God, for that. Thank you, God, for that. You are so good. Then these cares of the world are going to disappear, including this lie from Satan saying you're struggling and you're not doing good enough. You are good enough. You belong to God if you're covered by the blood of Jesus. What happens in the next chapter, do you know? We get all kind of requirements for the tabernacle. They're tedious. It's hard to read through it because it just goes on and on. And all these details. They were supposed to be followed to the letter. Because God is a holy God. Whatever He says, follow it to the letter. And if you read through, you'll see that this was the meeting place where God came to man. Where is it at now? This is where others meet God through your life, your faith. Shouldn't you be concerned about that temple? And Paul writes that in these scriptures that we've read this week. There's writings about offerings, about the Ark of the Covenant, the mercy seat, the table of showbread, the lampstand, so much more. But I'm just going to give you a comparison of them. The offerings that they presented then. Paul says, Therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Still sacrifices to be made got to deny myself, take up my cross, and follow after Jesus. My faith, my life is a continual sacrifice to God. And sacrificing is not easy. It's tough. You want to get off the altar, but yet you're called to lay down your life, your body, as a living sacrifice. The Ark of the Covenant, that's where God's Spirit dwelled. If people touched the Ark of the Covenant, they were dead instantly. God lives in you. So I said, can you imagine if one of them were here today and saw us and said, really, this, this is what it's like? And that Ark of the Covenant where God's presence was, where the law was put, was covered by the mercy seat. This Ark of the Covenant mercy seat were put into the Holy of Holies where only temp the high priest could consecrate himself and go in once a year to offer atonement of sins. Jesus poured out his blood on the mercy seat. And now you have direct access to God. The lid's not on the Ark of the Covenant anymore. In fact, we know from reading Luke that when Jesus died, the temple veil was torn. At least I think it's in Luke. It might have been in the other Gospels. I know it's there because <laughs> I read them along with it. That curtain that separates the Holy Holies isn't there. Jesus has poured out His blood on the mercy seat. We have direct access to God. Read all those details and everything. Now it is you and I. The table of showbread, where we come into fellowship and dine with God. And how much does Scripture tell us in the New Testament about that great banquet, that wedding feast that we'll have when our faith becomes reality? And then you got the lampstand that offers light so that everyone can see. There's so, I could spend so much time here. Chapter 25 talks about that veil of the Holy of Holies. And I remind you again how Jesus tore it in two. And then chapter 26 through 31 gives us more information about all of these details, which I'm going to say again, you are now God's temple. You are the link to Him. You are the hands and feet of Jesus in the world today. 
You are his messengers. You are his ambassadors. I could go on and on. You are the light of the world, salt of the earth. And then we get to chapter 32. It didn't take long after all these details where we get improper worship. What happened there? I know you know this one. Moses took a while up on the mountain, and what happened? They worshiped idols. I heard a lot of things. Thank you. I was waiting for idols. We don't have idols in our life today, do we? Do you want me to start naming off some of the idols in your life? Because I can name them off in mine. I guarantee some of them will hit yours. Yes, we do. We've got to get rid of those idols. If anything stands in the way of your time, your talent, your money, let alone your spiritual gifts, then it may just be an idol. I said may just be. It may not be. But when... Jesus is calling you to do one thing and you say, even though it's a great thing, my family, I need to take care of them today. Is he calling you to do something else today? He'll take care of your family. God's the only reason you have your family in the first place. And I'd much rather bank on him saving them than me being able to save them. So chapter 32, verse 31. Moses returned to the Lord and said, Oh, what a great sin these people have committed. They have made gods of gold for themselves. Yet now, if you would only forgive their sin, but if not, please blot me out of the book that you have written. I don't know if you knew Moses said that, but that's just like Paul said when he said, If he could give up his salvation to save them, he would. And that was to the Jews, which he just dusted his feet off to, to go to the Gentiles, to the Corinthians. And now, after a year and a half of being with them and a year on the road or whatever, we have all of this in the church. Well, neither one of them can give up their salvation, blot their name out. It's secure. But there's such a compassion that they have for the lost, for God's children that both of those two individuals said, if I could, I'd lose my salvation to save them. Now that's like Christ. Can't do it again, don't, don't get me wrong, but that is exactly what Christ did. He gave up His life to save you. His blood poured out. God's wrath taken out on Him so that you could have eternal life and so that you could live for the kingdom. What did you read through Luke? Constantly, constantly, constantly. What you've been taught so you can live as kingdom children. So I'm to 1 Corinthians. Chapter 1 starts out this way. Paul called to be an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God and our brother Sosthenes to the church of God in Corinth to those sanctified, now maybe sanctified means a little bit more to you for reviewing that, set apart and holy for God's use. To those sanctified in Christ Jesus and, there's an and here, called to be holy. Are you living set apart holy lives? <clears throat> Together with all those everywhere who call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours. Instead, in this church, there's division instead of unity. Instead of the message of the cross being preached, there's foolishness being preached. Instead of the power of the Spirit, there's the powers of the world, of the powers of darkness infiltrating this church. They don't understand their mission if they even ha think they have a mission. They're not building wisely. There's public sin that won't be expelled from the church. Instead, it's accepted as normal in the church. There's judging going on outside of the church, but not judging the members about being holy inside of the church. So Paul says, you are the temple of God. Now we're to chapter 7. I did it fast, see? Now about sexual relationships we talked about. Obviously they had wrote him, what can I get away with? What, what, what is too much? Can, it, can I divorce? All these things that we already know the answers to. 
And Paul basically said this, be married to Jesus instead. And New Testament scripture is clear, we're to present ourselves as a spotless bride for when he comes. Because we're in a loving relationship with God because of the covenant Jesus Christ wrote with His blood. Does that not change the way you live your life? This building isn't holy. It's a place we come to worship. It's holy when God's people are in it because He resides inside of each and every one of you. And you are to be holy when you walk outside of these doors so that you're salt and light for the world. Jesus hasn't come to abolish the words of the law. He's come to expound upon them and teach you so that you can live in obedience. So that all of heaven, all of creation can see how God is working through the power of His Spirit in lowly, wicked human beings who've been made right because of what Jesus Christ has done. All praise, glory, and honor to God the Father of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Wow. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 12 says, If anyone builds on this foundation, on Jesus, I'm assuming you have the foundation of Jesus. If you don't, then that's what you need to start with because you can't build on any other foundation. It's Jesus and nothing else not works, not anything else, no religious types, denominations, anything else. It's faith in Jesus Christ. If that is your foundation, then you have a responsibility to build on it. And you can build the foundation using gold, silver, precious stone, wood, hay, or straw. They're acceptable. His workmanship will be evident because the day will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire, and the fire will prove the quality of each man's work. If what he has built survives, he will receive reward. If what is burned up, if it is burned up, he will suffer loss. He himself will be saved, but only as through the flames. Do you not know that yourselves are God's temple and that God's Spirit dwells in you? I think we need to be reminded of that quite often. If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him, for God's temple is holy, and you are that temple. I said Friday night when we had Bible study, if I came in here and started just taking a spray can all over the walls, y'all would whoop me and have me out of here in no time. Because I have defaced God's house. Really? Think about that next time you say, should I or shouldn't I? Can I get away with this? You are God's temple. Bought with the price of Jesus' blood. I'm going to close from some verses from 1 Peter. He writes similar words. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3 says, blessed, by, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which I just said. Wow! We should continually be in praise and thanksgiving to God because He loved us enough to send us Jesus. It's all because of Jesus. Any problem out there is because of the lack of Jesus. It's not a drug problem. It's not a health problem. It's a Jesus problem. We even read from scriptures that that's why there's some sicknesses among you. It's a Jesus problem. He's the only cure, permanent cure. Is He your foundation? By His great mercy, He has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, unfading, reserved in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power for salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief and various trials, so that the proven character of your faith, more precious than gold, which perishes even though refined by the fire, hopefully your faith will not perish through the flames, may result in praise, glory, and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen Him, you love Him. And though you do not see Him now, you believe in Him. And you rejoice with inexplicable and glorious joy. Are you rejoicing with inexplicable and glorious joy? Do when others see you, do they see that or do they see this? Come on, laugh. I'm a Christian! Let the world know it. 
even in trials and persecutions and suffering, you, you just see someone who has cancer that's a Christian and see the peace that they have in comparison as long as they put their faith and trust in Jesus versus someone of the world. Because you have the peace that surpasses all understanding. This life, when it's over, is over. Who cares? What matters is what I have to do today for Jesus Christ. Because when it's over, I'm in glory. Now that you are receiving the goal of your faith, which is the salvation of your soul. Verse 13, Therefore prepare your minds, Peter writes the same thing, for what? Action. So that you do. Be sober-minded. Set your, set your hope fully on the grace to be given to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not conform to the passions of your former ignorance. But as He who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, Be holy because I am holy. Since you call on the Father who judges each work impartially, conduct yourselves in reverent fear during your stay as foreigners. For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life you inherited from your forefathers, but with the precious blood of Christ. Peter saying everything that Paul has said, he's saying everything that was written back in Exodus. And in chapter 2 he starts this way, Rid yourselves therefore then of all malice, deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander. Like newborn babies crave spiritual milk so that by it you may grow up in your salvation. Now that you have tasted that the Lord is good, as you come to Him, the living stone rejected by men, chosen and precious in God's sight, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in Scripture, See, I lay in Zion a stone, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who believes in him will never be put to shame. To you who believe then, this stone is precious. But to those who do not believe, the stone that the builder rejects has become the cornerstone, and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble because they disobey the word. How could this church be asking questions about what was right and what was wrong when they knew what was right and wrong? Most times those questions are asked, they're asked to justify myself. Like, who is my neighbor, Jesus? Because I want to justify myself no matter how righteous I think that I am. They stumble because they disobey the word. And to this they were appointed. But you instead are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, to proclaim the virtues of Him who called you out of the darkness into His marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Beloved, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from the desires of the flesh which war against your soul. Conduct yourself with such honor among the Gentiles that though they slander you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day He visits. There's nothing written in this letter that Paul writes about the world slandering this church in Corinth because they didn't see any difference in the church in Corinth. What a shame. So as you continue to read this, you'll get through... 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 this week, right? 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. Look at the things. Next is, Paul says, I would never eat meat if it caused my brother to stumble. Ask God to examine how you might cause someone to stumble. Jesus was clear about that in his teachings. It would be better for you to take a large millstone and put it around your neck and be drowned in the depths of the seas. You've been given the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Build wisely on the foundation that is Jesus Christ. Father in heaven, we thank you and praise you. Lord, we thank you for your church. May we take such a great salvation seriously. May we with reverent fear build upon the foundation which is Jesus Christ. 
And Lord, we cling to your promises that you will save others, not us, you will, but that you work through us, that you work through our prayers, through our obedience, that through our light, through our good deeds, others are drawn to you. May we make a difference as Springs of Living Water Church in Bonners Ferry to this community and to our world. Father, we thank you for the precious gift that you've given us through Jesus Christ. May we serve Jesus through the power of the Spirit. May we deny ourselves, take up our cross, and follow after Jesus each and every day. Lord, we thank you and praise you. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen.